Super excited to be joined by a very recognizable face in the horse racing industry. Gabby Gaudet, thank you so much for taking the time to join me to talk about some Keeneland. Finally, super exciting that the spring meet is upon us. Yes, I am so excited that we're finally back here at the spring meet. Um, it's been a fun winter, but I'm so, there's no better feeling than Lexington in the spring. It's just, I think, because the baby races and the crowd that comes out and obviously the Kentucky Derby, Triple Crown implications and Oaks implications. So it's really a great time of year. Not exactly going to be the spring weather. I feel like we've all been hoping for Friday and Saturday, though, starting off the meet, but we'll get there eventually. Well, it's kind of typical of Lexington, Kentucky, <laughs> right? That it would probably, there's a chance of snow on Saturday. <laughs> it's just, it, it is what it is. Um, it'll be great racing. Just bring a coat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have my rain jacket. I will be there Friday and Saturday. You'll be there every live day of racing. Um, super exciting stakes action going on on Saturday. We start off the late pick five that we're going to be discussing with race number seven, the Madison Stakes at grade one, Phillies and Mares, four-year-olds and up. We're going seven furlongs. There's some big names in here with the likes of Kamari, Bell's the one. I didn't think these words would really be ever coming out of my mouth, but I'm actually going to try to beat both of them with uh, the number three lady rocket for Brad Cox. I pay a lot of attention to New York racing and this horse is kind of one that came on my radar when she was second to Bella Sophia um, in the gallant bloom because of that really bad stumble in the start in that race. And you can just see her nose go to Bella Sophia's hose. And then she finishes an okay second small field, um, but has improved since then to win next two times out can handle a sloppy track, which may be the conditions on Saturday. Maybe that one Oh seven buyer is a little bit inflated, but take 10 points off of it. It's still right there with Kamari and bells. The one, how did you see this race? Yeah, I definitely considered her. I think Lady Rocket, unfortunately, is one of those horses that I've been around and handicapped and probably bet too many times to think that her last race was extremely legitimate. Now, it was super impressive. And if she comes back and runs a similar race, like you said, she should beat this field. But I guess I'm, I look back on her races, you know, of last year and even two years ago, um, in the safely capped, she might have just gotten that much better now. Sometimes we see that mares, they tend to really peak at their five year old season. I guess I'm still like a little sour though, <laughs> with some lost bets in the past with Lady Rocket. I actually did agree with you though. I'm going to try to beat both of those horses and Kamari and Bell's the one. I think Bell's the one is probably the more legitimate of the, I guess I should prefer her. Um, of the two, you know, horses that are uh, the focus is on. But Center Isle, I thought that she was kind of an up and comer. It took her a while to get going, but she's another one. She's in her five-year-old season. She looks like she's only going to get better um, if you look at the tail end of her four-year-old season. And her last race in the grade three sugar swirl was really good. I mean, she stumbled out of the gate. She recovered really quickly and she went on to win pretty easily. So, um, and I don't see a problem with her at the distance of seven eights. I, in general, thought that this was probably one of the more interesting races on the card. Yeah, I agree with you there. And there's a pretty likely chance that she's the one in front early on too. There's, um, she's going to be drawn inside of any other speed in here, I think. And I think that they're probably going to go. So uh, I like her chances as a possibility. Um, I wouldn't quite put her in the win candidate area, but I think that she's got a pretty legitimate shot. Yeah. The horse that she might have to contend with up front is the 10 to splendid news for Wesley Ward. And I think, you know, I, he probably wanted her in there too to make sure there was a legitimate legitimate pace for Kamari. Um, I, I will be curious to see how the pace scenario plays out there. Definitely. Um, moving along to the next one, the Shakertown Stakes. I think this race is pretty interesting. It's going to be race eight, a grade two for three-year-olds and up. Now we're going five and a half for lungs on the turf. Is Golden Pal just too good to you or are you looking elsewhere? I think he's too good. I, you know, I try to beat these Wesley horses during the spring and the fall. And it's just, you know, um, it's a moot point because they wind up winning. Um, you try to poke holes in him. 
Uh, and you look at his past performances, okay, maybe he doesn't like soft ground. Not really. He's performed on good turf before in the past. And even that Keeneland good turf course, it was a little bit on the softer side than good. So he can handle, uh, you know, soft turf courses. He can handle coming off layoffs. He's very fast. He's the speed. He gets IRAD. It's Wesley Ward at Keeneland. I just think it's I think he's going to be very, very tough to beat. Um, beyond him, though, I think Cowan is an interesting horse because if you look at him when he ran in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf against him in 2020, um, you know, that was a really solid effort. He's kind of one of those horses that can sprint turf or dirt, and sometimes I like those horses on softer ground. So I used those two, and I got to throw in my boy Diamond Oops. I have literally picked him every time. Like, I am on air. And he's in the in a race, um, so I just I have to throw him in. If I did not use him in the top three, I would feel extremely guilty. <laughs> I think we all have those horses where it's like no matter what, we kind of bet them or pick them every single time. Yeah. And um, I'm guilty of that with Midnight Bourbon. It's like oh, this horse doesn't ever win, but I can't stop picking him. <laughs> I feel that. Um, yeah, I think Golden Pal is just too good for these. I get if you want to take a shot against, but as far as favorites on this card, he's probably the likeliest winner of them to me. Um, if you took him out of the race, I'd love to root for Just Might. Um, I think that that DQ two races ago was a little bit questionable to say the least, um, but it's not as though he's going to be able to save ground more so than Golden Pal. He's drawn outside of him and um, I think the the nine Philo D Ariana is a little bit interesting making his U.S. debut. Um, he's a perfect four for four. He shortens up to the five and a half from seven. But I think that Golden Pal is probably just the class of the field. The there is only um, there's only a couple horses that have beaten Golden Pal. One of them is in here in uh, the Learjet. I think is also a little bit interesting. But I think it's kind of like okay, how do I get a little clever underneath this heavy heavy favorite that just seems like the likeliest winner. And I've always found it, I am a huge fan of Just Might as well, but I've found that when you have a horse like Golden Pal, who looks to be the best and horse to beat, um, you don't really want horses that have to go after him, right? He's going to be pressing the pace, and I would just prefer to have a horse that might close into that pace and try to get Golden Pal after putting in all the dirty work. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, the big one, I feel like I haven't seen this in a while where the major race of the day and then there's two races after. It's kind of like one after or something like that. Um, but race number nine, halfway through the sequence-ish, uh, the Toyota Bluegrass Stakes, the grade one, the derby prep, um, the race of the day, so to speak. What do you think about this one? Um, the... You know, I, I kind of had a tough time with this race. I was going back and forth between a couple. And, you know, I actually had a conversation with a D. Wayne Lucas recently about the Kentucky Derby. And it was so insightful to hear what he had to say. And he kind of compared it to the NCAA tournament, March Madness tournament, is that you, you know, you might look at maybe B. <laughs> going to happen at home <laughs> so many uh unpredictable things okay i at least have a hold of him that's waylon if you were interested he's a <laughs> um anyway, uh, he said when Dwayne lucas said you know it's really hard to um for the derby what makes it so fascinating is that you get horses from all these different venues all these different tracks and you might think that say um, Keeneland is a better track or uh, like the Derby preps at, at Keeneland or um, Gulfstream Park or the fairgrounds. But sometimes that's not necessarily the case. So, um, we, and that's what we get with the bluegrass. You get horses who've been wintering in all different places throughout the country. So it's really hard to predict, you know, which races were the, the better ones. Um, I went with Zandon, a uh, fun little fact the you you can't be too far off of the pace in order to win um at least since 
the bluegrass went from synthetic to dirt at Keeneland. You have to be either stalking or on the lead in order to win. And I think Zandon actually gets that trip. He had a bad trip last time out. He dwelt, he hopped out of the gate. Um, but I think his preferred running style is to sit that right type of trip, just be behind the pace setter. So Zandon will be my top selection. I'm curious with Ethereal, Ethereal Road because I thought he had a really wide trip and had to make an early move last time out too. And then Smile Happy, you know, he's a legitimate horse. Um, I just worry about that outside post. Yeah, Zandon is my top pick in here too. I would love to see him get the right setup and um, get a win of his own that isn't you know, kind of like, oh, well, he didn't break or, oh, well, the, everything that happened in the Remsen with Mo Donegal, like, I want to actually see this horse um, get the credit that I feel he deserves and get a win for his own in the bluegrass here. And uh, I agree with everything you said. I think he's going to be able to stock the pace. Um, I think Fenwick will probably go again. Um, the two top Pletchers in here, I kind of have my rose colored glasses on for charge it of the Pletcher horses, um, but not really for either of these two. I have obviously everybody has to respect the connections, but um, as far as command performance, I don't see it. Um, but Todd must. So <laughs> I think that they're interesting, but not horses that I'd want to take at whatever price. At least he's not one to nine in here. Um, but I don't see it with this one for a little bit of a price underneath, though. I've kind of always uh, been a fan of Volcanic, the number five, um, not as a win candidate, but as one to kind of round out your exotics or something like that, um, who beat Charge It when Charge It was making his debut. Uh, the race that kind of impressed me from him was as a two-year-old when he was in Saratoga. He totally missed the break and then ended up closing strongly at six furlongs there. Then they throw him in the hopeful, doesn't show up. Then he's off the layoff, comes back as a three-year-old. Obviously not the best performance in the Sam F. Davis, um, third to Classic Causeway, who was a no-show then in the Florida Derby. But I think he's kind of like the, the third one that I'd want to use behind Zandon and Smile Happy. So I'm curious to see what we get from him. Yeah, there are a lot of horses in there that I think you can kind of pick apart and be and and, and make him interesting to use in exotics like Exactas and Tries. I know a lot of people are on a manual thinking that he might go gate to wire uh, for Todd. I just didn't really like his race in the Fountain of Youth. And with command performance, um, you know, it's hard to pick a maiden in a race like this. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of – and this is very unusual for me to pick against Todd Pletcher. Usually he has these flashy three-year-olds that I just absolutely fall in love with. But I'm kind of in the same boat as you. I, I think um, these two – I don't know. They could win. It wouldn't be surprising. But – I'm j I just don't get that vibe from them in here. Yeah, agreed. Um, race number 10, allowance optional claiming, Phillies and Mares, four-year-olds and up. Now we're going to mile in the 16th. The favorite in here into vanishing, second last time out to champion Latruska in the grade three Royal Delta at a decent price in there. That was actually her only second start on dirt. Um, the first one on the dirt was on a sloppy track at Aqueduct where she was third. She's been super consistent, seven lifetime starts, six of which are in the money. She makes a lot of sense in here and will either be stalking or up near the front. Um, but if you're looking beyond the favorite, I think that the five temper time, getting back to the dirt after three starts at Turfway is a little bit interesting. She comes in off a win. She has plenty of off track experience, including her maiden win at Churchill Downs. Um, she'll also be close early. For Ilio Gami and Tabor Hall, I kind of want to see one off the bench from either of them. Um, so nothing super creative in here for me. What do you think? Yeah, I I was with you with uh, Tabor Hall and Iliogami. You know, I thought that one, the more legitimate horses in here, it, they're, it's their first race in a long time, in a couple of months. And it's probably easier to get away with it at Keeneland because a mile and a 16th, the way the track is, you know, you go to the alternate finish line and it's a little bit of a shorter stretch. And it, you can probably get away with it at Keeneland versus tracks like, say, the fairgrounds. I think you really have to get a horse fit in order to win, you know, at that distance first off of a, a couple of months. But still, they might, you know, need a race. They might need to get some of the rust off. So Suki is actually the horse that I went with at – 
I don't I don't have the morning line, but um, should be a decent price. I don't think she's the best horse in the field, but I do think that it could be right time, right situation for her and just stalking the pace and maybe catching some of these arguably better horses that might need a race. Um, so that's kind of how I assessed this. I thought even Miss Imperial, Jerry Hollendorfer's horse, might fit that bill too. With Into Vanishing, I, I just want her to prove that she is that quality. I mean, she was 30 to 1 in her last race when she finished second to Latruska. And sometimes we get sucked into, you know, saying, oh, well, she was second to Latruska. She must be really good. But I still think she needs to uh, prove herself a little bit. And once you get to those outside post positions, 11, 12, you know, you really have to be, in my opinion, much the best in order to win. And I, I think this is a pretty level playing field. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. And I mean, that was a complete merry-go-round race too. Last time, nobody really changed positions at all. So um, Crazy Beautiful was in that race, but it's not like anybody really made up significant ground or had the opportunity to. So yeah, absolutely. If you don't want to take a short price on her, um, I did just get the morning line earlier today. So Suki's eight to one. I think Miss Imperial's 15 to one. So some great opportunities for that. Um, and then to close it out, you go back to a five and a half furlong turf sprint allowance horses, four-year-olds and up. Um, the favorite in here, one of the favorites, first time on the turf for a son of Warfront in the striker. Um, ships in from Woodbine, has had two races on the synthetic, which were both wins. Horse he beat that day has come back to win uh, twice since when he was bringing his maiden. That's Ghostliner, which is a name that I remember because I needed Granger County and Ghostliner's last win. Um, so I was like, Who, how do I know this horse? But that was it. Um, if he runs the same race that he won uh, his maiden with, speed figures wise on the surface, he wins here. But I think that I might be looking for one with the turf experience, not that he won't take to it, but post 12 is kind of difficult in these sprints. Um, Charles Chrome, the six horse, is a little bit interesting to me, second off the layoff. He finished third as the favorite after a bump at the start at Tampa. He gets another half for long to work with, and he's not going to be way too far off of it. Um, number four, infinite Wesley Ward at 15 to one on the morning line is not something you see too often in a turf sprint. He hasn't been seen since March of 2021, but he does have a win on yielding turf all the way back in November of 2019. And Wesley is 29% off 180 days layoffs. So can get them ready if this horse is still of the same caliber to uh, run his race in here. I really like Momos in here. Um, this is a horse that I've liked for a long time, even when Christoph trained him. And if you look at the six and a half for a long race, at Santa Anita, he just didn't want to go that far. When you get to these turf sprinters, especially ones that kind of prefer five, five and a half furlongs, they can't go beyond that. So I can give him the benefit of the doubt. I actually thought it was a pretty good race, all considering that. He was just he just lost by a little over two lengths in there. Um, he's handled yielding ground before. If you look at his race at Mammoth and the My Frenchman, he's handled it even a couple starts ago in the Nearctic um, at Woodbine. So I actually really like him, and I think he's going to be either on or near the lead with Saez, especially who's an aggressive rider. So I went with him on top. I did use Artemis City Limits as well. To me, he's kind of that true turf sprinter. And he's, I mean, he really does give it his all. If you look at his races in the last year or two, he's always there. He always hits the board. So I thought that you kind of wanted to lean on a very consistent sort, at least for the exotics in here. And then I actually didn't use striker in my top three. I uh, went to the four infinite as well. Layoffs don't bother me with Wesley Ward. I think you just have to kind of look to the class and this horse might not be there in terms of class. I think it's interesting that he brought him back at this level in this very tough allowance race, but um, you know, and Wesley word we trust, especially at Keelan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Momos is one of those horses that fits that profile of, I pick this horse every single time. Yeah. And this is like when I'm jumping off the bandwagon and I'll probably end up regretting it. But I did actually get to see him opening day of Saratoga last year. And it was a really hot day that day. And all day long, I was like, I'm going to place a big bet on this horse. Or sorry, it wasn't opening day. It was uh, August 11th last year. But um, I was like, I'm going to place a really big bet on this horse. This is the, my pick for the day. That's it. And he just 
did not look like he was handling the heat at all that day. It just seemed super washed out and not very lively. And that's not what I wanted to see from a horse that I wanted to go to the front. I think he ended up finishing fourth that day, but the heat, not going to be a problem. The heat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. You mm -hmm. won't have to worry about the heat at all. I think it, uh, yeah, that's an interesting race. And I think the conditions of the turf will probably alter my opinion. Um, it, you know, it's going to rain a lot tomorrow on Friday. It, there's a chance of rain or snow on Saturday. So by the time we get to the last race on Saturday, I'm just curious what kind of shape the turf will be in, even if the race stays on the turf. You know, there's so many unknowns with that last race. Yeah, absolutely. These are kind of like my my ideas if everything stayed as it should weather-wise and then a couple of mentions of ones that could handle an off-surface, but I'm with you. I'm going to kind of see how it goes and call an audible on race day and see what happens as far as the weather. But um, yeah, that should cover the sequence. And thank you so much for your time. I know you have a million and one things going on. So it, it's much appreciated that you took the time to chat about this pick five with me today. Of course. Thanks for having me on and good luck with all your picks this weekend.